of Representative Goldberg. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I understand the rules of engagement tonight. Um, are you saying that you want to limit uh, Representative Adams or any other representative to a, to a speaking time limit um, before they have to give up? No, no, Representative Goldberg, I did not say that at all. Okay. I just want to make sure we weren't time limited. I, I just want to know the rules of engagement. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't say anything about a time limit. So that that's should not be an issue for you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Brown. Uh, okay. Uh, ter uh, Mr. Adams, first question, just my input. When we went from 2G to 3G to 4G, now 5G, a couple of things have happened. We brought antennas from hilltops and in the distant uh, distant areas into our towns and cities. And when you bring the source of radiation closer to the population, you're increasing their the intensity of the radiation or what's called the power density. So when we have these antennas and these small cells on, on poles that are right outside of people's homes, they're getting much more radiation than they did when the network was a mile away, for example. It's also, as, as uh, Mr. Chamberlain uh, expressed, they're using higher frequencies, and as you increase the frequency, you are increasing the, uh, the power within that radiation. So the biological effects could be greater. They need to be studied, but they have more power. Um, so that's that. And I can't remember, what was your second question? Um, my second question, um, you know, when these phones um, tiles were put up in the neighborhood, some of the same concerns that you have now was brought up back then. But now most of the neighborhood um, have accepted them because of the way life have um, involved with the uh, Apple phone, the laptop, the tablets. Um, everybody sort of like willing to do a little sacrifice um, to get better reception or be able to call 911 in any location in the state. So some of these frequency um, has been accepted. And we right. have even accept them on buildings. So there's there's an analogy of putting frogs in a pot of water and slowly turning the heat up and the frogs won't jump out even until they're cooked. And that's kind of what we're doing to the population. We're slowly increasing the intensity of the radiation from all these different sources. And although people are feeling worse and they're getting sick and they're having symptoms, they're not correlating that to their radiation exposure. People do not understand that they can't sleep because their Wi-Fi router is turned on. They don't understand that they have ringing in their ear and all kinds of other health effects uh, from this technology. It's only the people who have electrohypersensitivity that can correlate exposure to symptoms. And even with them, sometimes it takes a couple of days for them to, to develop symptoms or it may be a couple of days after exposure before the symptoms go away. It's very hard to correlate when you turn on the exposure for them to have symptoms. So that's, I believe that's one of the reasons why the population, they don't understand it, they don't get it. Okay, and my last question would be, um, I mean, I, I noticed um, some of the research, they talk about 5G was just the next, um, generation and other cable companies and phone companies are offering. I'm looking at um, some of the companies offering one to um, one to eight um, gig of um, 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 gigs um, with fiber internet service that would allow you to get the yeah, optimal fiber speed up to eight eight gigs. So. Um, when these companies that's already in the game, would they have to come back to us and get approval? Because, I mean, um, here's my problem. The less competition, the higher the price. The more competition, um, the whole community um, benefits. When you got one person dominating the market, and, I mean, so the prices keep going higher. So even though 
if a new provider is getting the game and the other company is already offering 5G, so the frequency or whatever you're saying would be the same. And if they can go to 8G without coming back for city approval, what different would it be? I mean, all, all this would do allow this company to not be competing in the market that's already dominated by another company. So it wouldn't even allow um, another player to enhance um, their footprint in the market. So, I mean, I don't want to like pick sides, but I think if the other company is already doing the 5G and I'm getting better reception um, um, from from a, um, a tower that's miles away from me, that's totally mile away from me. Now I got a new company just putting up a few poles in a designated circle to see how it worked. Wouldn't this be better for the community? I mean, I'm going to understand about the frequency, but we're going to get that from the old company and we're going to get that from the new company. So whatever harm there is, is already being harmed by the old company anyhow. So now you put another player in the game. Wouldn't it be better for the community? Because understand you say about the about the frequency and how to harm people, but try taking your your Apple phone from your kid and tell them we're gonna pluck up a new um, G phone on the wall, and now you gotta still dial it and take the cell phone away. I think we beyond that. So, I think this competition. Um, make to feel a lot better. Um, what is your opinion on that? Okay, thank you, Representative Adams. Um, I'll go to uh, Judge Holtzberg first, and then I saw uh, Ms. Davis and then Mr. Sandry. Uh, thank you very much. Before I sign off, I just want to make a couple of uh, observations in response to some of the comments and try to refocus what I think is the appropriate issue before the committee. First of all, there is an extensive discussion, or at least a modest discussion, about the decision in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Trey Smith and I are aware of it, and that decision actually proves our point, which is while the D.C. Court of Appeals took the FCC to task, for not discharging its responsibilities. At the end of the day, it, it, it stated very clearly and unequivocally that all of these concerns that have been raised tonight and are the subject of this very meaningful conversation are still under the purview of the FCC. And, and that that's really the import of that decision insofar as our conversation is concerned tonight. I do agree uh, with with uh, Attorney Sandri about the residual uh, legislative powers that communities like you have. And in fact, if I can point you to page five of the agreement, which is before you today, it enumerates, as Attorney Smith said earlier, all, all of the uh, all of the requirements that the city can impose as a condition of approving a siting. And let me just quickly quote, for example, uh, the applicant, that would be the carrier, would re be required to include a structural analysis demonstrating that the pole or other support structure is capable of supporting the equipment. Um, at the same time, the application must submit an RF emissions report with calculations prepared in accordance with FCC requirements and demonstrating this small wireless facility will comply with applicable federal maximum permissible public exposure standards. Uh, the uh, applicate, applicant may be required to uh, comply with local permits, including but not limited to a building permit, an electrical permit, a grading permit, a tree trimming permit, a historic uh, district certification. So the only point I want to emphasize in closing, as Attorney Smith points out, is that this proposal, which is just a template for an application, you're not tonight, if you vote to approve this, you're not uh, approving by any means the siting of any small cell facility, any place in Stanford. All you would be approving is a process 
to allow the permitting process to go forward. And as Attorney Smith pointed out, and I think this is critical, this agreement by its terms provides the city of Stanford and all the other cities with more rights and opportunities to regulate the carriers, as your very thoughtful speakers have suggested tonight, than would otherwise exist. So notwithstanding all of the appropriate and reasonable concerns about the safety of, of the cell towers, uh, what is before you tonight uh, really is a much more limited uh, uh, proposal, which is Will there be a uniform application process that confers on the city of Stanford all of those obligations that Mr. Sandry appropriately pointed out reside with you? And in the absence of this agreement, will you still have the ability to do that? Uh, because the even if you don't approve this tonight or tomorrow, whenever you vote on it, uh, that's not going to stop the carriers from coming back to you and applying and you'll still be facing this issue. So I will stop my comments with that. I don't want to take up any more time than is necessary. Thank you. I will go to mm -hmm. Ms. Davis. Uh, con concerning the, the question about um, 8G and 8 gig, I think I can clarify something. Um, a gigahertz is not the same as a G, all right? and Basically, one, two, three, four, five G are just marketing terms. In fact, five G doesn't is is being created as we speak. They don't know exactly what it's going to look like right now. Five G is using a different frequency than it will be using later on, and all of that is a work in progress. And unfortunately, from a public health point of view what industry is asking us all to do is to allow them to figure it out as, as they go along and assume that there are no health effects. So eight gigahertz doesn't mean eight G. And I think that was, there, there may be some confusion about that. And electromagnetic fields are really complicated. And because they're complicated, it doesn't mean you can't understand them at all but they are genuinely complicated. And I'm really delighted that you have before you today some of the world's top experts in understanding all that, in particular, Professor Chamberlain and Mr. Sandry. And I'm going to volunteer Mr. Sandry to look over whatever agreement you're considering as he is formerly an attorney who worked out of Stamford and understands these issues uh, uh, unlike most people. Uh, and so I would, volunteer him for that purpose if you're uh, if he's willing to accept it and perhaps he can give you an independent uh review with no disrespect meant to any others that have looked at this so far but it is often the case it's rare to get an attorney that understands the science to be quite frank it's complicated it's mo no disrespect to anybody it it is genuinely complicated it's taken me about 15 years to understand some of this. And I defer completely to my colleagues, uh, Professor Chamberlain, Mr. Sandry, who, who know much more about how to set things up. And of course, Dr. Brown um, understands this from the point of view of what he sees in the hospitals where he works, uh, a different kind of understanding. Uh, and I think that you have before you the opportunity to get more information, but I wanted to offer that clarification about the G's. The G's are basically marketing terms, okay? Thank you for that insight. And so we'll go to Mr. Sandry. Thank you. Yeah, if you uh, added G's, uh, there's, there's gigahertz, there's a spectrum band, as Dr. Davis mentioned, and there's the marketing terms, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. There's also gigabits, the amount of capacity that comes through a base station or through a phone. And so the, all that is, there's, so there's, there's three different G's at least being mentioned in marketing literature and in other literature when you're purchasing a phone or deciding to buy a broadband plan. The other thing is when you go to 5G uh, networks, typically according to McKenzie, uh, in anywhere from uh, five to 20 times more, anywhere from fivefold to 20 fold more towers will be deployed. And that could be small pole based furniture level, 
precurrent level systems to, you know, on large towers. So in terms of density, there's going to be a lot more radiation, a lot more radiation if you believe the uh, McKenzie report, which the industry uses to, to fund its own deployments. Um, and then going back to what the, uh, the judge was mentioning and what Dr. Davis was mentioning, you know, it is, it is critical, you know, I think all sides agree, it's critical to understand the templates uh, well and have everyone at least really clear on what they're what they mean what they imply so uh, um um I, I happily review the uh the you know the uh the, the proposed template and also in connecticut i had a child who went to the Art academy uh, uh, uh just west of you all i mean i'm east of you all and in uh, at the U.S. Art academy there's something called voluntold which means yeah, you do it <laughs> so i happily review it thank you Thank you, uh, Mr. Sandry. Uh, Ms. Levitt, go ahead. And then we'll go to our next uh, representative, uh, Representative Sherwood, for questions. I just wanted to add um, that uh, the G stands for uh, generation. So it's first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation. Um, but um, 5G is really engineering-wise substantially different than uh, than anything that's gone before. It's really machine-to-machine -machine communication. That's what it's intended for. Um, uh, less so for um, uh, for uh, it's for it's for things like um, you know uh, driverless cars and things things along those lines. That's what it's intended for, and it is very much evolving, as uh, as as Dr. Davis pointed out. Um, so uh, that's all I wanted to add for there, uh, except that um, I just wanted to to say that um, the board is being asked to regulate in an extraordinary vacuum, uh, which is what uh, these presenters have uh, have put to you. And I disagree slightly with um, the uh, the interpretation that um uh, we are locked in under the current regulations. I mean, yes, we are to some extent, but one of the other things that Senator Blumenthal has said over the years, and I know him, um, is that uh, when the federal government refuses to regulate adequately, that duty then falls to the states. And I think that the information that has been presented here tonight um, certainly makes a very strong case for the fact that the the FCC that has overriding jurisdiction on this particular subject is in serious dereliction of duty. I mean, they're waving aside a tremendous amount of, uh, of research. Um, I also wanted to point out that the Connecticut uh, uh, Public Utility uh, Regulatory Authority um, has jurisdiction over small cells um, uh, be only because they're mounted on utility poles. They basically don't have too much in the way of experience with um, with wireless technology. That's been under the uh, Connecticut Siting Council, which has a lot more savvy with environmental reviews and holding the uh, the industry to uh, to account on their exposures. Um, I also wanted to point out that both uh, Pura and the Connecticut Siting Council um, are on record as saying that they um, that if the applicant applies for permits, uh, they pretty much assumed that they wouldn't be doing that unless they really needed it, um, uh, which is which is a little strange uh, 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 to to assume. They 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 just automatically give the benefit of the doubt to the fact that the infrastructure is needed, um, and everyone uh, ends up uh, sort of um, uh, hiding behind the federal preemptions and low emissions uh, computer models uh, compared to the FCC standards. But the way those models are presented, uh, such as Empiris findings of fact um, uh, for the for the ship and uh, uh, road site, um, they're really a smoke screen that's intended to create a sense of safety that really doesn't exist when it comes to this subject. And I don't think that people should be falling for that. One of the more um, uh, advantageous things that would uh, dovetail with what uh, uh, Joe Sandry has has pointed out is get true RF assessments for um, for for what these exposures are going to be. Insist on far more accurate exposure projections from both AT and T and Verizon for the total RF load that will be combined from all citywide sites. Um, uh, that's that will give you a much closer uh, um, understanding of what it is that you're being asked to. 
uh, to approve, um, insist on RF exposure projections for the total number of antennas for all providers and projected providers um, within each small cell. Pure's findings of fact, um, and uh, others have mentioned the maximum permissible exposure limit, uh, their, their findings of fact uh, are based on AT&T's um, allowance to submit uh, only one antenna's maximum permissible exposure. That is typically how these very low exposure ratios are um, established in uh, in the public record, which makes people think that it's a that it's a very low exposure. When you take the cumulative effects into consideration, that's when you uh, get a better idea. Um, there can be dozens and dozens of antennas in one small cell. And to do the maximum permissible exposure for just one antenna is very, very misleading. Um, you can also have hundreds of channels transmitting within each antenna. The actual exposures are much higher that are coming out of these facilities than people understand. Um, Stanford, uh, unlike other municipalities, has, has this potential baseline that they might be able to refer to if you still have that in the record, which would give you a much closer um, idea of what has changed in your immediate environment since the 1980s and since that program stopped. Um, you've got a lot that you can do down there, as has been pointed out, to be able to bring much safer technology to the city. Um, uh, and I'm sincerely hoping that you're that you're going to do that. Uh, just because we're under the FCC um, umbrella at this point and the preemptions of the Telecommunications Act from 1996, if we don't take a stand against that, um, that puts municipalities in the position of being in complicity with this status quo. S at some point, someone is going to have to stand up and say, this just will not happen. Uh, this, this cannot be allowed to happen. Maybe that will be Stanford. Maybe, maybe that will be you. You, you, have, you have good grounds um, and, and all the knowledge. We've armed you very well tonight with, uh, with, with what it is that you need to, uh, to, to do something uh, really constructive and probably creative and yet have, have cell service and, and good connectivity for Stanford at the same time. So. I yield back. Thank you. And we'll go to Representative Sherwood for uh, her line of questioning. Thank you, Representative uh, Bucus. Um, I have I have a question for, um, let me see. Um, I have a question for Mr. Chamberlain from the University of New Hampshire, if that's okay. Um, sure. So, uh, Mr. Chamberlain, you described uh, how the FCC came to what their what their allowable limits are, and you described uh, the the study with with the um, with the rats, and so you said that these rats were essentially these rats were essentially starved and then they were and they were already trained to be um they were already trained to be to 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 access food through pressing a lever and uh they kept them i guess in some sort of container with the lever and as uh as they sat there they increased the i guess the radiation in in that vessel uh until the rat was physically unable to um to to, to press the lever is that is, is that correct yeah, you sound as incredulous as i felt the first time i saw it and that's where i mentioned i i had to go through it multiple times before it sunk in what you just described is perfect that's what happened it's kind of like putting them in a microwave oven and continually increasing the power until finally they couldn't function. So yes, that's so, exactly what they did. I have so, to add, they measured their temperature with a rectal probe. Right. Okay. So, but so the, the FCC's, um, the FCC limit is basically a limit in a rat that once the rat's, body was no longer able to function well enough, even while it was starving to press a lever, 
that is the the legal limit of exposure that the FCC allows. Well, I mean, they, they, they took that number and then divided mm -hmm. it by 50. Where they got the number of 50 from, I have no idea. But they took that that exposure where the, the monkeys got burns on their faces from the radio frequencies. And then they divided it by 50 and they said, well, that's fine for the population in general for 24-7 exposure. With no scientific study on what that 50% level was over time or anything like that. What you say is absolutely correct. So, no, there was no rationale such as if we divide by 50, we'll get a relative risk of such and such. No, they didn't do that. They came up with the number of 50 and said that'll work. And then it was only a factor of 10 for workers. Okay. So, um, Thank you for that. Um, the the other kind of so um, Representative Adams in the beginning asked what the difference is between four G and five G, um, and I think what I heard was that with the five G and this contract, um, utility companies the 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 telecommunications companies would be able to come in and put um, cell towers or they're, they're called, you know, small cells right. um, on, on utility poles here in Stanford, um, which from what I, I gathered from what you guys were saying is different than how it is now because um, in a lot of ways, we have, you know, a tower somewhere all far away from our homes and our businesses or our schools and everything else. Um, but if this were to be allowed, there could be um, an undisclosed amount of small, small cells um, on utility poles. And I think, you know, I live right next to my houses. I have a utility pole like right at my house. Um, so is that, I mean, I know that there's a number of differences, but is the, the, the amount of exposure due to the fact that these small cells could be virtually anywhere a, a utility pole is in the city kind of the main difference here? I can let other people answer that, but I do know from experience in New York City where they allowed these 5G small cells to go in, they ended up being right next to people's apartment windows. So yes, that can happen when you allow 5G in. Would anybody else care to comment? Well, I, let me just add from our from our experience, first of all, small cells are not necessarily small. A single 5G antenna system can have more than a hundred different signals beaming and beam forming to a phone or a laptop. And keep in mind that in order for 5G to work, you need a 5G router, a 5G computer, a 5G phone. 5G doesn't work on its own without new equipment. That is why I say it's the 5G, fifth generation, is basically a marketing strategy. Ultimately, if 5G were to be universally implemented in all the major cities, then your old equipment would no longer work. And that's, that's a huge, great benefit if you're trying to sell equipment, but it's not a benefit if you're trying to keep essential metals out of your trash, which because that, that is a serious problem of electronic trash that I know you have dealt with otherwise in your county and your city. And, uh, and eventually uh, it, it's creating a, an artificial need which will be driven by the fact that you won't be able to use old equipment. So the 5G antennas are, they may call them small because there's the number of different antennas within them, but you are correct that you're taking a signal that used to be on mountaintops and bringing it right smack to your bedroom window. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so 
if if the board of representatives decides to um not approve this small wireless facilities right of way and access agreement um what what are the the consequences to that well I mean, I, I haven't seen the agreement, and as I, I did suggest, it would be useful for you to have an outside lawyer look at it. And I think Mr. Sandry agreed with me that he would do that. I, do, I can't answer that question. Oh. Um, Miss is uh, Mr. Sandry. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Yeah, I, I, without um, if I'm reviewing it, but but. Go ahead. Um, oh, okay. You haven't reviewed it. That's, um, that's okay. Let me ask you, I do have a question for you. Um, so do, and I, this is to you, Mr. Sandry, do the mobile companies certify that their 4G network deployments meet the FCC human RF exposure standards for base stations and for the mobile devices they connect to? Great question. So they're they're supposed to, and what is uh, lacking in again? I came from industry, so I, for three decades, um, what I believe is lacking is the actual reports where they where they certify that they are complying, and making those reports available for review for a process like this prior to uh, approving some new five G. Did they do four G correctly? Um, and when you see those reports and the amount of radiation that is already being exposed to the public, um, were those reports done properly? And um, one of my jobs, uh, I run the National Spectrum Management Association. This is the group that, you know, they're, they're the gatekeepers before any wireless network is deployed. And they make sure that your router doesn't interfere with your baby monitor, doesn't interfere with direct TV and all that kind of stuff. Um, so they have very sophisticated methodologies for understanding if there's going to be harmful inter interference into networks and devices. Now, humans are devices. And so they should be able to prove that they're also not interfering into us. And um, and there is a very ancient you know, uh, FCC standard they should be able to show compliance with. And if they haven't done that compliance, then they violated terms of their licenses. Uh, there's a part 101 of the 47 Code of Federal Regulations, which... Uh, and part one of the of, uh, Code of Federal Regulations under which the FCC requires them to be doing these studies, as well as a bulletin called Bulletin 65 and a variety of other rules. So if they can't produce compliance, that might be something to be aware of. If they can produce their compliance, the, the reports they say are compliance, will they make them available for third-party review and you know certified uh, you know, professional engineers Spectrum managers, and also the general public and academics and everyone else, all the professionals here who can then take a look at that and say, oh, you know, at this school or at that nursery or at that nursing home or at that workplace, you know, there's X amount of radiation and, you know, then people can be more aware of it. There's also signage standards and OSHA standards. Um, and it, it was mentioned prior that, you know, heretofore when you had 3G and 2G, you had rooftops and towers mostly housing the base stations. Now they're down close to us on street furniture, on, on light poles and you know, right, right outside your balcony. But I'm not seeing the proliferation of the signage that you're supposed to see when you're up on a, when you go by a mobile tower, I'm sure there's a bunch in your neighborhood. If you try to even get to it, there's often those big towers, there's fencing around it, you can't even get to the tower. And then there's signage. And you, you, we've all seen these signs about, you know, being, uh, you know, caution, can't go past the fence line. Uh, and as uh, uh, Dr. Chamberlain mentioned, uh, also there's you know a tenfold. You know, it used to be it's a fiftyfold drop down uh, of of uh, from the RAT standard for humans who are in the general public, and it's a tenfold standard. I.e., occupational workers can be exposed to a lot more if they're climbing towers, they're on rooftops, and they have even a different signage for that. But in both those cases, those OSHA standards and those FCC standards for posting signage. We have not seen, you know, your eyes can tell, you know, you can, your eyes can tell the, when you walk around your neighborhood, you see the base stations, but you don't see the associated signage. 
So they're going to have to prove that everything they've deployed is uh, they, they didn't have to put up the fencing and signage that they're required to under law. Uh, and they had a good reason to not do that. And you probably want to know that now for the existing network prior to approving so, it down the road. So um, all, all 40 members, and thank you for that, that answer. Um, uh, all 40 members of, of the board of representatives are volunteer Um and so, you know, first, I, you know, I want to say thank you to um, to everybody that that came tonight. Um, Rob Brown, Blake Levitt, Deborah Davis, um, Kent Chamberlain, Theodora Scrato, uh, Joseph Sa Sondry, um, because you guys are really, you know, I, I, at least in the United States, but I, I would argue global leaders in in um in this field uh you're certainly experts and um so i guess my question is and i to to you joe um as as you know i'm i'm a i'm a i'm a biologist but i certainly don't know how to um ask these big communications companies to provide that type of information. So they're supposed to be able to, the, the mobile companies are supposed to give us um, the certification that their 4G networks meet the FCC human RF exposure standards. But how does someone like myself or the, the reps in this on this board or in this committee, how do we request that information and get it? Representative Sherwin, uh, sorry, just to interrupt, this is uh, Chair Bukas. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, I'm just going to hand the chairship over to Representative Matheny while uh, Representative Sherwood continues with her questions. So I will still be present, but uh, Representative Matheny will be chairing the meeting. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Sandry. Thank you. Well, yeah, no, I appreciate the question. And, you know, as D Dr. Davis mentioned, when we respond to if, 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 if the uh, uh, BORs are open to this. Uh, we'll, we could look at the proposed template, and it, as a process inside of that, we could place the requirement uh, for them to prove that they've been acting responsibly for the last X number of decades while they've been deployed in Stanford. One, two, we could also uh, provide a template letter to go out to the carriers who are already operating and ask them for a checklist of materials that would be publicly reviewable and peer reviewable. Um, and then three, you know, not only to provide those materials, but also a commit to respond to any, you know, sensible peer peer review based inquiries about their uh, their uh, their operation. And because often, what I've in my professional experience, often the reports we get back don't show the equipment they're using. They don't show enough uh, data uh, that would allow a professional spectrum manager to assess whether or not they're they're uh, uh, they were even measuring properly for RF exposure before they deploy. Um, and those are things you're going to want to know, especially with that base station hanging outside of a, you know, a, a preschool or a, you know, if you're going to buy a condo on, on court street nearby and you're looking at another condo on summer street and they're kind of identical, you might want to know which one has, especially if you're uh, concerned about this issue, you're gonna, you, the real statement value might go up for the one that has less exposure. You might want to know that. Uh, and there's a whole variety of other reasons for your tax basis and for human health and for economic health to, to want to know this. And I think carriers ultimately are going to want to compete on safety, much like the auto industry started competing on safety after they were required to put in seatbelts, things like an auto glass. Uh, um, so, but that's a long-winded way of saying we, we'd happily give you a proposed letter for you to send to the to the carriers. Uh, well, thank yeah, you for that. Me, Representative Sherwood, this is Attorney Rosenberg. The with respect to both the 4G and the 5G, those records are available for Pura, and I will volunteer to obtain those records from uh, from Pura and and provide them to the committee. Okay, thank you, um, Chair Matheny. Do I still have the floor? Yes, you do. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Saunders, you had said that um, when you were responding to Representative Adams about the difference between 4G and 5G, 
um, you had said that there would be five to 25 times more towers deployed um, or small cells deployed than what we have right now. If you could just expand on that. Yeah, there's a, uh... So this, McKenzie uh, did a report on this. And the reason for that is for threefold. One is there's a lot more spectrum being utilized. All the channels that were being used in the past for 1G and 2G are still being used, and they're adding more channels. And the uh, the 5G channels uh, are anywhere from 24 gigahertz, 38 gigahertz. These are spectrum bands that I used to manage that are now helped by Verizon AT predominantly. And they're much wider. One of those bands... In fact, the 38 gigahertz band had, has more spectrum in it than all the TV, radio station, and, and mobile phone networks, prior mobile phone networks combined. Um, so it's like adding Alaska, you know, to, uh, you know, the lower 48 all of a sudden, uh, or, you know, when you keep adding more and more, and then you're adding Jupiter to, to Earth in terms of the amount of capacity and the amount of spectrum being utilized. Um, so they need... And that spectrum also doesn't propagate through walls. Uh, so they need much more um, connectivity by line of sight connectivity by using smaller and smaller towers closer and closer in uh, for those higher uh, band bands. Yeah. They, they, they also transmit a lot more data. Um, and when you're exposed to what's called a polarized waveform, it's more bioactive. Uh, and so you need to also measure for that with the human RF exposure standard. Bioactive means you know, you're, you're literally, your body's you know, reacting to it. Um, uh, so that, that's one layer to that. Um, uh, another layer is I highly recommend there was a special supplement in the Wall Street Journal uh, two days ago, three days ago over the weekend um, on 5G. And it, it points out the the, the massive uptick in mobile phone usage, but also in IoT or Internet of Things. What's also going on is that there's billions and billions of devices being deployed, you know, smart, everything from smart posters to things embedded in the highways for tracking traffic to things being embedded in hospitals and being embedded in schools and go down the list to tracking all sorts of things from weather to to transportation hubs, to internet usage, to go, just go down a, a list of anything you can imagine. So that 5G deployment is also those added towers and base stations, small small base stations are are needed to, to deploy, to connect to those IoT devices, which again are radiating us at an exponentially larger level. And they're 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 you know they're gonna continue to roll out if we can if we continue to enable as a society, more and more of these small cell base stations. So, so as a follow up to that, two things. The first is, um, you had said that five G is a much wider spectrum. So, like one G and two G were a, a a smaller part of the spectrum, and then um, as we're moving up, we're getting more different types of radiation all at once. And so when they when they decided what the the safe limit or level was, the FDC with those rats, um, and dividing, you know, when they couldn't press the button, uh, and dividing it by fifty percent, um, were they testing with this wide of a spectrum, or was no. it a smaller a, a smaller spectrum? It was a pathetically smaller amount of spectrum, and I, I could leave it to to everyone, you know, Dr. Davis and Theodore and and Mr. Chamberlain, but it was a pathetically small slice of spectrum. So, Excuse so me. sorry, this is Representative Maureen Pollock. A uh, point of clarification or point of information? Um, I've heard the statement about divided by fifty and divided by fifty percent. Can you please clarify which one it is? It is divided by 50, not 50 percent. And, and it was an arbitrary number because the EPA standards up to that time usually divided by 100 or 1,000. That was more commonly used for a so-called safety factor. The only reason for the 50 uh, for the general population and 10 for workers was because at the time, the people developing the standard realized it would be completely implausible to allow the technology to 
propagate if you did not use a standard that was that low. And by that, I mean, not protective of public health, but a, a small number as opposed to a larger number. To give you a contrast, the standards for pesticides or food contaminants are usually, you take the level at which you have no effect, it's called the no observed uh, level, and you divide it by a hundred or a thousand. In this case, they assumed that the level at which the animal stopped trying to feed itself, although it was starving, the level at which it got hot, that that could simply be divided by 50. There is actually no biological foundation to the standard, as many people have written, as in fact, the 5G commission that Professor Chamberlain worked on has said, as we at Environmental Health Trust have said repeatedly in a lot of documents that are available on our website, and as Dr. Brown indicated to you this evening as well. Um, so the standard, so, so to speak, is is really rests on what I'm afraid I would have to call a, a, a deck of cards. And, and I really, again, want to commend you for asking this question, because I don't think, to be quite frank, that any public official has even got figured that much out. So really thank you. Sorry to interrupt, Nina. Oh, no, that's OK. Um, Chair Matheny, can I continue? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so essentially going back to to this study where the the FCC creates their safe, their quote unquote safe limit, um, the rats were not exposed to the spectrum that is being proposed in the contract that is before this committee. Is that a correct statement? Correct. Okay, so the 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 contract that's before this committee um, requires that the the um, the telecommunications company who put out uh, or who put up these these small cells um, they they're required to not go over the limit that was. Um, that was defined by by these rats. I guess it was in in the nineteen eighties. Um, is that correct? So the the contract is only limited in terms of um, of the exposure limit to what the FCC said based on those rats. Yes. Okay. Um. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so all of all of the stuff that's in here that says that you know they're going to abide by the FCC limits and everything else, we're talking about a limit that has just been named as safe, but um, is is really an arbitrary number that isn't even that can't even be scientifically linked to the same spectrum of radiation that the environment here in Stanford and the people here in Stanford would be subjected to uh, if this contract were to be approved. That's my interpretation, yes. Okay. Um, I, I probably have a number of other questions, but I am, I'm sure there's a lot of people who want to talk, so they might answer my questions, and if not, I can come back. So uh, thank you, Chair Matheny. Um, I'm all set at this time.